murders of Dylan Millard would take place over almost a year, but they would remain essentially unknown. That is, until Millard's secret was unlocked by what happened outside Ancaster, Ontario, on the evening of May 6, 2013, just past 9 o'clock. Hello everyone, welcome. If you're new here, I cover mostly Canadian true crime here on my channel. Today we're going to be talking about the case of Laura Babcock. This is part two, so I highly recommend that you watch part one first, and I'll link that right up here for you. It will make much more sense if you watch that first. This takes place in Toronto, Ontario, and this one's really going to make you frustrated, to be honest. They're all very frustrating, but this one's really just going to make you mad. In this video, I'll have a little bit more to add as Tim's case wrapped up fairly quickly, and Lauren and Dylan Millard also briefly had a relationship as well, so that adds to the complicatedness of this video as well. And the reason why I started with Tim's video is because up until he went missing, the police did not care that Laura went missing. He kept saying that she would just turn up. Laura went missing almost a full year before Tim did, but I'll get into all that in this video. So we left off with Dylan Dylan being found guilty at the trial in June 2016 for the murder of Tim. For Tim's murderers, their life sentence begins now, and ours began over three years ago when they murdered Tim. Now we're just going to jump right into the case of Laura Babcock. Laura's friends described her as a ball of energy. She was easily liked and had a lot of friends. She was the life of the party. What we know of Laura is that she was full of whimsy. Her friends also said that she was glued to her phone. She was the type of friend that would call you 20 times a day just because she wanted to be in touch. She Laura grew up in a middle-class family in Toronto and she had dreams of becoming an actress. She had recently graduated from the University of Toronto with a degree in English and drama. Dallin and Laura met at a bar in downtown Toronto they dated briefly for about a month and a half, and they did remain friends afterwards. As we know from the last video, Dylan was born into a wealthy family and would throw lavish parties at his parents' properties. He dropped out of college, and that's when the drugs became more boundary pushing. Just knowing the kind of drugs that he was doing, um, it was clear that he was looking to really push the limits in all areas of his indulgences, and I think that he thought he was untouchable. I and the parties were getting bigger and more wild. A friend we'll call Dana saw him a large social circle from the inside. The parties just kept getting wilder and bigger. Yeah. And then eventually, in a couple of years later, I would say that like hundreds of people my age in Etobicoke were coming through these kinds of events. He would do robberies and steal things, essentially all for the thrill of it. I can only assume he didn't have too many consequences to his actions growing up, and that's why he was able to get away with so much. He really did think he was better than everyone. He almost had a godlike complex. I'm not exactly sure when, but Laura started dating a guy named Sean Lerner. He was the exact opposite of Dylan. He was a very nice guy. Sean and Laura dated for about a year and a half before they broke up, but they did remain friends. While they were still together, Sean threw Laura a 22nd birthday party. Dylan and the girl he was seeing at the time, Christina, attended the party. And on Laura's birthday a year later, in 2012, Christina sent this text message to Laura. Happy birthday. A year ago today, I slept with Dylan. Babcock quickly texted back, that's fine, I slept with him a few weeks ago. Laura's such a savage, I love it. Laura did have problems with her mental health, and her mental state was starting to decline, and it would sometimes leave her homeless. To make ends meet, she sometimes would take work as a paid escort in downtown Toronto. She's 23, and somebody said, hey, you could get an envelope of cash just for hanging out with these yeah. older guys for a night. I'm not sure if that was mental health necessarily or the lure of money, but it certainly wasn't a long sustained period of her life. It was very new. There's about a dozen documented hospital visits. Laura would talk to the doctors about her anxiety and depression that she was feeling. Laura did want to get her life together and stand on her own. She wanted to find work with her degree and get a home of her own. Dallin sent this text in mid-April of 2012. This text from Millard to Babcock reads, you are harmful to me. Please don't try to contact me. And the next day, Dylan texted Christina with these messages about Laura. First, I'm going to hurt her. Then I'll make her leave. I will remove her from our lives. CBC reporter Trevor Dunn says, knowing what we know now, it's hard not to read between the lines. In the spring of 2012, Laura was couch surfing between places and relying on her friends and family for a hand. Sean was such a nice guy that he paid for a night at a hotel at the end of June 2012. He found a pet-friendly hotel so that her dog could be with her. They had dinner, and he gave her an iPad as a gift. And then Dylan and Laura got back in contact with each other. 
But despite Dellen Millard's warnings and threats, incredibly, Laura had got back in touch with him. They exchange more than 110 phone calls and texts. So that's how much in communication they are with each other. On July 3rd, Laura met Dellen at the, the Kipling subway station in Toronto. Then, according to Laura's cell phone data, they headed to Dellen's house. The last time Laura's cell phone was ever used, it was at 7.03 p.m. that night to check her voicemail. Laura's friend said that she was glued to her phone, so if she didn't use her phone after that day, that is very suspicious. There is also no activity on her bank account or her health card after July 3rd. Shortly afterwards, Millard sends this text to his pal Mark Smitch. I'm on a mission back in one hour, and after that, nothing. A few days later, Laura was reported missing by her ex-boyfriend, Sean. Yes, he was a constant presence always around her, keeping an eye out for Laura. The police pretty much dismissed Sean's concerns right away with, she'll turn up, she lives a high-risk lifestyle, etc. CBC reporter Trevor Dunn says for some reason, Toronto detectives appeared not to care. Laura Babcock is missing. The police are looking into it, and Sean Lerner comes to them and says, I think you should look into this guy. His name's Dellen Millard. And they say, maybe later. That name now, Dellen Millard, is notorious. So Sean had no choice but to start looking for Laura himself. Sean tracked down her phone records and started calling the last people that she had spoken to. And that's when he came across Laura's last phone calls were to Dellen Millard. Sean gave the records to the police, but they didn't look into that lead until much later. In May of 2012, Dellen asked an employee of Millard Air to make a homemade incinerator, but after a few test runs, he ordered an industrial-sized incinerator instead. On July 2nd, the day before Laura disappeared, Dellen purchased a 32 caliber handgun from a Toronto dealer. The day after Laura disappeared on July 4th, the iPad that Sean had given to Laura was hooked up to Dellen's computer and renamed Mark's iPad and then Dellen gave the iPad to Mark as a gift. The afternoon after Laura disappeared, there was a very disturbing photo saved to Dellen's phone. It was a blue tarp that was rolled up with his dog sitting next to it, and it did turn out to be Laura inside that tarp. I'm not going to insert the photo. If you guys want to see it, you guys can look it up yourselves. On July 5th, Dellen finally got the incinerator that he had ordered, and after many test runs, on July 23rd, 20 days after Laura had gone missing, Dellen sent this disturbing text to Mark. Barbecue has run its warm-up. It's ready for meat. At 10.38 that evening, 20 days after Laura Babcock was last seen, a time-stamped screen grab shows a Millard Google search asking, what temperature is cremation done at? That's followed by this image of his pal Mark Smitch at the Millard Air Hangar with an incinerator rake. And this video of sparks emanating from the incinerator, burning what forensic investigators would later say are human remains. In the weeks following this, Mark Schmidt was bragging that he had killed a girl, but no one believed him. I probably wouldn't either. He even wrote a rap song on Laura's iPad about her murder. Also, I'm not going to insert that. You can look that up yourself. Staff member Art Jennings learned of escalating tension between Dellen and his father, Wayne Millard. Millard Air CEO. All I know is what I was told is that Dell's father was going to cut him off because Dell was spending too much money and was not taking responsibility for the business, and his father was not going to let him ruin the business that him and his father, Dell's grandfather, had started. On November 29th, 2012, Dellen's father, Wayne Millard, was killed by a gunshot to the head, which Toronto police quickly called suicide. It was deemed a suicide and his body was cremated without any further investigation. But a year passed, still no Laura, and still nothing from the police. It wasn't until the spring of 2013 when Dellen kidnapped and killed Tim, the police would look further into the deaths of Wayne Millard and Laura Babcock. While Dellen was waiting for the trial of Tim, the Toronto police laid first-degree murder charges in the murder of Laura Babcock and Wayne Millard. Authorities in Toronto laid charges in two cases that virtually ignored for months. The disappearance of Laura Babcock and the supposed suicide of Millard's father, Wayne. Both would now be called homicide. Dylan Millard, 28 years. 
has now been formally charged with first degree murder in relation to the deaths of Wayne Millard and Laura Babcock. And police investigators continued to scour Millard's southern Ontario farm, where they'd originally found the incinerator containing Tim's remains. They excavate and searched, looking for evidence of other crimes. On May 14, 2014, Sean launched a formal complaint against the Toronto police for their negligence and failure to follow protocol. Detective Mike Carboni insisted it was all done by the book. The investigation was thorough and, employ and employed all of the traditional methods used in any missing persons case. That's just spin. You know what it is, it's insulting really. And uh, they know that. And it's not fair to the dead and that family, you know, it's just not fair. You, you, should, you shouldn't play politics or cover up when it comes to homicide. What you should do is deal with the facts. Joe Warmington is the veteran crime columnist for the Toronto Sun, who took the Toronto police to task for negligence in the Babcock case, then and now. At the end of the day, this is so ugly that the police actually had the name of the killer right in their hands. Now, you, you can judge up and down and say they didn't know that, but that's their job to know that, to figure that out. And they could have talked to him, and they didn't. And, you know, I'm not mad at them. I understand that, you know, things happen. But the reality is they actually had the name Della Millard right at the beginning of this case. And, you know, no one bothered to make the call. And, I, you know, again, that must keep some people up at night. But, of course, the impact wasn't only felt in the Babcock investigation, but potentially also in two other cases that subsequently took place, the deaths of Della Millard's father, Wayne, and of Tim Bosbaugh. Even the idea that the, he knew that the police were on to him, it could have changed exactly. everything. It's not easy to second guess, and, and they don't like it, and I understand why they don't like it. Well, that's not what this story is. This story is they were given the name and phone number of the eventual killer, and they didn't take it and run with it. And then there were 65 smuggled letters from Dylan Millard behind bars, coaching his girlfriend, Christina Nudge, what to do and what to say about Laura Babcock. To get out of this bind, I need help. We need to get our story straight. I need to know what you're willing to do. Whatever you may believe, it needs to be put aside. This is what happened. In those handwritten messages, Millard concocts a fictional plot that Laura Babcock had disappeared after overdosing while taking drugs with Mark Smitch. Later, when she was reported missing, you asked me if I knew anything. I told you that Mark had told me that she had OD'd probably for mixing her prescriptions with Mark's Coke. We read this a couple of times, then destroy it immediately. Five years after Laura disappeared, there would finally be a trial. And late in 2017, Dellen Millard and Mark Smith would be the accused again, this time in Toronto, as the Babcock family, whose daughter vanished five years earlier, finally got their day in court. Dellen Millard made the bizarre decision to represent himself grabbing the chance to dominate the courtroom for seven long, often excruciating weeks. During the trial, Dellen decided to be his own attorney. While Laura's father was on the stand, Dellen proceeded to ask very personal questions regarding her mental health. There was gasps in the courtroom because no one could believe that he could ask these types of questions. However, it was just proving how sick and twisted he really was. The evidence in Laura's case was all circumstantial, but it was all telling nonetheless. Between her last phone calls to Dylan, the chilling text messages he sent to both Mark and his girlfriend, the photos and videos on Dylan's phone, and Laura's belongings were found in Mark's possession as well. The police officer who seized it brought the red bag into the courtroom. And it's just a bag. But the officer held it up for the jury to see. And you can see her handwriting there. And you know, it's her bag, but it was in Mark Smitch's bedroom. Even moments like that, it just, it hurts you. And let's not forget ordering an industrial size incinerator around the time Laura went missing. Now, the overarching question. What did the Toronto police know about the murders of Dylan Millard? And when did they know? The investigation was thorough and, employ and employed all of the traditional methods used in any missing persons case. At the end of the day, this is so ugly the police actually had the name of the killer 
writ in their hands, and they didn't take it and run with it. But juries don't often witness everything that happens during a court case. And in this case, against Dylan Millard and Mark Smitch, there was a lot that was kept from the jury. Courtrooms are pretty basic places, tables and chairs for the lawyers and defendants, usually benches for the gallery, but generally pretty simple. So jurors in courtroom 27 may have been curious about the heavy curtains around the co-accused tables. That was to hide the belts binding their feet. Steel shackles would have been too loud. Every morning, the two men were brought in before the jury arrived, handcuffed too, but those were taken off. And why was this hidden from the jury? To avoid having to mention that Millard and Smith are already convicted killers in one of the most gruesome cases in Southern Ontario, a crime that was never mentioned in front of the jury. Well, Millard waits to learn whether the jury here finds him guilty of Babcock's murder. He's staring down another court date the jury didn't hear about. First degree murder in the death of his father. After a seven-week trial on December 16th, 2017, Dylan and Mark were convicted in the murder of Laura Babcock. Both men were sentenced to life in prison with no eligibility of parole for 25 years. Every morning we were greeted with smiles and words of During the trial, Laura Babcock's parents asked for privacy. After the verdict, her father Clayton thanked friends, family, and the judge and prosecutors who had seen justice done, finally, for their daughter. I just want to say, we've sat through a six-week funeral for our daughter, Laura. And uh, you all know what a wonderful woman she was, as well as all the pains and struggles that she faced. You also know about the evil beings that took her life, and if society's lucky, we will not see them again on the streets. In the end, it is likely that Charlene Bosma may best understand how the Babcock family truly feels. The Toronto police absolutely dropped the ball on Laura's case. They didn't take her disappearance seriously from the beginning, and because of their negligence, it ultimately led to the death of Tim and Wayne Millard. There's no doubt by the time Dylan got to Tim, he absolutely thought he was going to get away with it. Two murders down and not even on the police's radar. I could see why he was pretty cocky. And get away with it, he did. You'll recall Toronto police missed crucial clues, even though Laura Babcock's former boyfriend, Sean Lerner, had told them about all the phone calls with Millard the day she disappeared. Officers were grilled about that later. Do you happen to know if Millard was interviewed at the time? Uh, I don't believe the police interviewed uh, Millard at the time. Indeed, it wasn't until a year had passed, in 2013, after Millard was arrested by Hamilton police, that Toronto detectives held this news conference and for the first time spoke Dylan Millard's name in public. I can confirm at this time that there appears to be phone contact on July 3rd, 2012 between Laura Babcock and Mr. Dylan Millard. But wait a minute. They knew about those phone calls 11 months before. How could it take almost a year for homicide investigators to acknowledge that already received the information that could have led them to the suspect. If the police had looked into Dylan Millard when Sean had, had handed his name to them on a silver platter, chances are this might not have happened. However, we can't change what happened, so let's just hope that the Toronto police takes missing persons reports more seriously going forward. Laura's remains still have never been found to this day. This beautiful young girl truly never got the chance to become her full self, and it's honestly so devastating. She trusted Dylan, and he did the absolutely worst thing you could do to someone. Dylan is a complete psychopath, and there's, there's no doubt he doesn't feel any remorse at all for the three murders he's committed. That's all I have for today, guys. As always, if you have any case suggestions, please leave them in the comments below. And until next time, thanks, guys. Bye.